thank you so much for joining us again today and I am praying that you are going to be blessed by the worship and the word today. Amen. If you're joining us for the first time, my name is Julius Bakunzi and this is Every Nation Bromfontein Church and, and as you can see, we are in a COVID-19 lockdown and, and so as we get started, I want you to know that we are praying for you. Every day at 6.30, we are praying for you. No matter where you are in the world, we are standing in prayer for you because we're all going through this together. And particularly this week, we are praying for our nurses and our doctors, our security guards, our policemen, everybody in our essential services. The, the least that we could do because we honor your work and we thank you for what you're doing. The least that we could do is cover you in prayer as you serve our community. Amen. So, so we want you to know that. And, and today, as we get started, uh, we are going to be doing some communion. I want you to prepare some bread and a little bit of grape juice and, and, and I'll explain a few of those things as we go. But, but my word for us today is no destructive plague will touch you. No destructive plague will touch you. As we go to worship, I want you to prepare your heart for the word and I'm trusting God that no destructive plague will touch you. Amen. Turn with me to Exodus chapter 12, verse 13. And here's what it says. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Amen. Now, everything in the Bible speaks about Jesus. Everything from Genesis to Revelation, it all speaks about Jesus. And, and in this verse, we get to see once again how the blood is a sign that speaks about Jesus. Amen. Now, in this context, in the story, Israel is in slavery. They have been enslaved by Egypt and, and Moses is about to go and challenge Pharaoh. And he's going to say to Pharaoh, let my people go. Amen. Now, as he's challenging him, he's going to release all kinds of plagues. He's going to release flies, but the people weren't set free. He, he released uh, frogs, but the people weren't set free. He released darkness and gnats and, and all kinds of things happened, but the people were not set free. But when the blood of the firstborn was shed, the people of God were set free. When the blood of the firstborn was shed, the people of Israel were set free. This is a picture of Jesus Christ. This is a picture of the, the firstborn of God. That when his blood was shed, the people of God are set free. Free. Now, you might be here and you might be enslaved by all kinds of things. You might be enslaved to sin. You, you might be, you and I have been enslaved to, to all kinds of different things, relationships and, and porn addictions and all kinds of things that, that keep us enslaved. But I'm praying that as I'm speaking to you about the blood, as I teach on the blood, as we preach and we think of this blood this morning, I'm praying that shackles are going to break today. I am praying that, that prison doors are going to open today. I am praying that captives are going to be set free today. Because when the blood of the firstborn was shed, the people of God can be set free. Amen. There's a scripture that says that whom Jesus sets free is free indeed. If you are, if you are in chain to anything right now, I speak to you right now. I speak the blood over your life and I speak freedom over you right now today in Jesus name. Amen. Now, firstly, so my first point to you is the blood is a sign that speaks of Jesus. My second point is this, the lamb is for you and your household. Now, let's go to this verse very quickly. Uh, in, in, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 3, he says this. 
Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. Now, now they were going to take this lamb. Each man was going to take one lamb for their whole household, one lamb for their family. And they weren't going to do like we usually do and, and come in one central place and have this meal or have this communion in one place together. Not at all. They were, they were going to all have this meal in their houses similar to what we are going to do right now. We are doing exactly what this scripture is speaking about. Wherever you are, we're going to take this communion by ourselves. Take this communion for you and your family. Now, the lamb speaks, once again, speaks about about Jesus. Jesus is the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world. Jesus is the Lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. Jesus is the Lamb that the scripture is speaking about. Now here's what I want to say. The Lamb was slain for you and for your household. The lamb was slain for you and your whole house. So when you take this communion today, don't just take it for yourself. Take it praying for you and your whole household. I, I want you to be praying for your wife today. I want, I want you to be praying for your husband today. I want you to be praying for your children today because, because the lamb is for you and for your whole family. It's for you and for your whole household. Now, this reminds me of Acts 16. There's a, there's a story in Acts 16 where Paul and Silas were, were facing their own lockdown. They were, they were locked down in prison, as I was saying uh, about a week ago. They were, they were locked down in prison and they began to worship and pray. And when they worshiped and prayed, the earth began to quake. The chains began to break. The prison doors were, were flung open and eventually this jailer runs in. He show, he's so shocked by what's happening. He falls to the floor and he says, tell me, how can I be saved? How can I be saved? And, and Paul speaks up and he says to him, he says to the jailer, believe, believe and you can be saved. You and your whole household. And that evening, him and his household were baptized and they were saved. That's the kind of prayer we want to pray today. I want you to be praying for you and your household because the Lamb is for you and your family. Amen. Now the last verse that I want to share just on this point here is this. In verse 7 it says this, then, then they are to take some blood and put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lamb. So, so what was happening is they would go and they would put blood on the side of the door frames and blood on the top of the door frame. Blood right there so that when he sees the blood, he's going to pass over. Now, before we get to that point, uh, this would be a good time for you to walk around the house and start pleading the blood over your house. To, to go to the kitchen and start pleading the blood. To, to go to the bedroom and start pleading the blood. To go to the bathroom and start praying over the... To go to the, the crib of your children and start pleading the blood. To, if you're staying in one little room, room just to go to the different four walls and just start pleading the blood pleading a covering over your family that that's what I'm asking you to do this lockdown time would be the perfect time for you to walk around the house in your garden in every room and just lay down and say God would you cover my house with the blood and I'm praying that you're going to do that and, and and if God covers your house with the blood this leads me to my point number three he says this he says, when I see the blood, I will pass over you. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Now, now God doesn't just want your physical doorpost to be covered under the blood. God doesn't just want the door frames to be covered under the blood. God actually wants your life to be covered under the blood. God wants the blood to be on the doorpost of your heart. So I want to ask you, are you covered by the blood? Are you under the blood of Jesus? Have you, have you given your life to Jesus? Now, here's what I mean. 
God was about to judge Egypt in that story. God was coming to judge Egypt. He was going to judge the land and he was going to judge the gods of that land. And as he was coming to judge them, he gave them a plan for their salvation. He gave them a plan for how they could be saved and how they could avoid the judgment. And, and his plan was they, they weren't going to be saved because of how much money they had. They weren't going to be saved because of uh, the connections they had. Maybe they knew Moses and, 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 and they, were, they were in that club. They, they weren't going to be saved because they were priests or pastors or, or anything like that. They weren't going to be saved because of how attractive they are or any number of things. The only thing that mattered was the lamb that was slain and the blood that covered the house. That's the only thing God was looking at. He was looking, is the blood covering that he, he wasn't scrutinizing what's going on in the house he was looking as the blood covering the house so God's plan is this his plan was that if the lamb was slain then the people could be saved if the lamb was judged then the people could be justified if the lamb was killed then the people could live and they would live not based on their effort. They would live not based on their good works. They would live not based on their qualification. They would be alive because someone died. They would live because a lamb was killed so they could be alive. I, I don't know if you can hear what I'm pointing to right now. I, I don't know if you can hear the subtext of what I'm, what I'm pushing you to. But, but when I'm speaking about the blood, I'm speaking about Jesus. When I'm speaking about the lamb, I'm speaking about Jesus. We, we don't have a physical lamb. We, we don't have the liquid blood. But what we have is Jesus. God's plan for your salvation, God's plan for you to be saved from judgment is to look at that lamb, look at that blood, to come to God and say, God, I want to be saved and I am trusting in the blood of Jesus that was shed on the cross to cover me and save me from your judgment. That's his plan for salvation. That's his plan for you to be saved. And I'm, I'm praying if you, if, you, if you haven't been saved and if you haven't given your life that you would do that today. Now, just a couple of things before I move off from this point. Now, there's about 2.5 million Israelites in this story. 2.5 million Israelites in Egypt at that time. Now, we would be crazy to think all 2.5 million of them were just holy, holy, uh, goody two-shoes, uh, living right, just perfect human beings. Not at all. They, they, these 2.5 people were just people. They were people just like you and me. Some of them crazy and, and some of them kind. Uh, some of them reckless and some of them trying to be righteous. Some of them uh, are trying to do the right thing and some of them couldn't even care less. 2.5 million all types of people but when God comes to the house he doesn't look at what's going on inside the house to determine whether they can be saved he doesn't look inside and say you know what she committed abortion she's not gonna make it you know what he committed adultery ah, he's not gonna make it ah, he, he's he's addicted to pornography ah, he's not gonna make it he, he wasn't scrutinizing the details of what they've done in their house all he was looking at is is the blood covering that house and if the blood is covering that house he says when I see the blood I will pass over you this is the good news that you can you can be saved from judgment if the blood is over your life. Now, I don't know what's going on inside your house. I, I don't know what you're doing or what you've been doing or where you come from, but all I can say, no matter what it is, all God is looking at is, is the blood over your life. Have you, have you come to him and say, God, save me, no matter what you've done or where you've been, if the blood covers you, you can be saved. Now, does that mean we're allowed to sin? Does that mean that we're allowed to do whatever? Not at all. In fact, let me show you this verse before I go to my last point. In verse 8, he says this. 
That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Underline that without yeast. In verse 15 he says, For seven days you are to eat bread made without yeast. On the first day remove the yeast from your houses. Remove the yeast from your houses. For whoever eats anything with yeast in it from the first day through the seventh must be cut off from Israel. What is he talking about? Now, it would take too long to explain it, but basically the, the yeast in Scripture usually speaks about sin. The, the yeast is pointing towards sin. And what God is saying, remove the yeast from your house. Remove the sin from your house. In fact, you could say to your neighbor right now, remove the yeast from your house. Amen? That's what he's saying. He's saying that, that if there's sin in your life, as you come to this communion table, you need to get rid of that sin. You need to get rid of that, 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 that stuff that's been held up on your life. You need to come to God. If that's you, you need to come to God and say, God, forgive me of my sins and, and remove it from your life as you come to that communion table. Amen? Now I'll say one last thing on that before we close, but we'll get to that in a second. So I've said to you, I've said to you, the blood is a sign that speaks of Jesus. I've said to you that the lamb, the lamb is for you and for your household. I've said to you that when he sees the blood, he will pass over you. Which brings me to my last point. That last line there says, and no destructive plague will touch you. No destructive plague is going to touch you. Now, obviously he's speaking about the final judgment, obviously. And he's speaking about the, the plague that's happening, the literal plague that's happening in that country. But we, we are standing definitely for the final judgment, but we're also standing that this coronavirus plague, it will not touch you. Can you believe that with me? Can you stand on that with me? That no destructive plague will touch you. Now, I want to give you this last verse even as I start to wrap up. Amen. Go down with me to verse 11. He says this. He says, this is how you are to eat it. With your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Okay. So he tells them, eat it in haste, tuck in your cloak, put sandals on your feet, eat it with a staff in your hand. So this was not something they were going to eat and then go and sleep. This is not something they were going to eat passively. They, this was eating on the go. They, they had to eat thinking about God is about to do something tonight. They were eating with urgency in their heart. They were eating with expectation in their heart. They were eating ready to go. They were eating saying, God is going to deliver us today. God is going to save us today. And that's how I want you to eat this communion today. I want you to eat it not just lethargically or lazily or passively. I want you to eat this communion with faith. I want you to eat it with expectation. I want you to eat it thinking in your heart, wow, God is going to do something. I want you to eat it thinking God is going to save us. God is going to deliver us. God is going to do something through this today. That's how God wants you to approach the communion this day. Amen. Now, as I close, I want to throw out three prayers. Amen. Uh, if you're here and you have never given your life to Jesus, if you're here and you, you want so badly to be saved, I want you to come to that communion and I want you to say, God, would you save me? God, would your blood cover my life? God, I'm trusting in the lamb that was slain for my sins. Father, would you save me? And I'm, I'm telling you right now, God is going to save you. 
Or number two, if you are here and you have, uh, you've been living in sin, you've been doing all kinds of things and, and you're wanting to change that and you're wanting God to do something in your life, I want you to come to that communion and, and I want you to pray and say, God, cleanse me. God, forgive me. He said in John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, God is faithful to cleanse your sins. So I want you to come and say, God, cleanse me. Remove this sin from my life. And as you take that, that, that cup and that bread, I'm telling you now, the blood of Jesus is going to cleanse you from your sins. Amen. Now, thirdly, if you're here, uh, everybody that's listening to me on this broadcast, I want you to pray for protection. I want you to pray for the blood to cover your life. I want you to pray that no destructive plague is going to touch you. And as we stand together, I am trusting that God is going to do an amazing thing in your life. Amen. So we're going to go to worship right now. And as we go to worship, feel free to pray as your heart leads you to pray. And as soon as you feel ready, feel free to go to that communion. And I'll be praying for you in Jesus' name. Amen. This is the Arab for joining us today. I, I hope that was a blessing for you and I, I want to invite you to join us next week. We're going to be celebrating Easter, celebrating what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross. You see, Jesus won a victory for you on the cross. Come join us as we celebrate that. Amen. And the last thing that I want to say before you leave is, is, is this ministry is supported by your tithes and your offering. We're going to put our bank details up on the screen right now. And if this, if this ministry is a blessing to you, would you use those details to send your support? Outside of that, I want to remind you that we are praying for you every day, 6.30, praying for you. May God bless you as you go forward. And I hope to see you next week. Amen.